Hey, how's it going everyone? Today I have a walk-in cooler for a new customer. Uh, according to them, um, they've had a couple com companies come out. Every five months they are having to refill the unit. Uh, that's obviously a big no-no here up in the uh, greater Toronto area. So let's get this bad boy defrosted and um, let's find a leak. So every five or six months tells me the leak's gonna be pretty small, but you know, we're gonna be thorough like always and we're gonna find this leak. So first things first, someone has put some dye in there, which I hate for my gauges, but it is what it is. So let's see what's going on there. So as you can see, I equalized the system. I have 126 PSI of pressure in the system on the low side. Um, that's gonna be plenty to do a leak test. Um, obviously, if we don't find the leak, we're going to bump it up to the maximum we need to find this leak. Um, it's not an option. We cannot gas and go. Um, that's a big no-no here in our area. So let's start with the usual suspects. Um, so these coils here, as we know, uh, tend to like to leak on either the U-bends or they will leak on this distributor, if you, as you've seen in a couple of my videos in the past. So I'm expecting a leak somewhere in this area, but the fact that the other companies couldn't find the leak is telling me it's probably not gonna be in a normal area, but let's go check the whole system, usual suspects, see if we can narrow it down and find it. Um, so far here, as you can see, I've had zero luck finding the leak. And a lot of these brace joints are questionable here. So let's hit them up. We're gonna hit up every piece of piping in the system. Bunch of insulation missing here but still no hits. So let's keep carrying on here. Um, I do have the uh, playback in a little bit of a fast forward just so the video is not 40 minutes long. So uh, that's why the beeping sounds funny on the leak detector. So, so far nothing there. Let's go check out our right hand side of our EVAP coil. See if we can get any hits on this side. As you know, like I said before, the U-Bends like to leak on these. Um, and depending on what they're keeping in there, so if they're storing something acidic like tomatoes or whatever and they're not in a bag, I find that will rot the coils. Um, so we've been telling a lot of uh, this specific chain of uh, restaurant to put their stuff in bags. All right, so nothing down there. So let's go hit up the roof here and see what we can find. All right, so as you can see, it's a really hot day today, so I don't want to spend a lot of time up on this roof. And this type of roof, this white roof, reflects the sunshine like in your eyes. So sorry if some of the um, footage is a little bit uh, questionable. It's out of my control, but let's go hit up all the joints here. I don't see any oil. Um, right by this receiver here, there's a little thing that could potentially be an oil puddle, but that may be someone who just you know, hit up some Viper spray on that and that's the residual. But so far, no luck. Let's come up here, hit up our headmaster, see if any of those joints are leaking. Still no luck. Uh, let's go hit up our condenser, which, you know, it's pretty rare we see a condenser leak, but I think like in this case, I'm pretty desperate. <coughs> and let's go hit up the face of the condenser, see if anything's hidden here. So, so far, no luck. And, oh, we got a hit. This is good news. All right, we got something here. So let's go back here and let's just confirm this thing that it is in fact leaking. And yeah, she's going insane. We definitely have a leak here at the low pressure switch. And if we go here, yeah, you can see some oil, definitely signs of oil. And then we're just going to go hit inside the switch. So I'm just showing this part because I like to take the cover off always. Sometimes you won't get the hit from the outside. So make sure you're taking the cover off. And I like to use the leak detector because obviously soap bubbles would not show up on this type of leak. And if you look closely, there is our die. That's how small this leak was. Okay, tiny, tiny leak. So this is why uh, the other guys were having issues finding this leak and you couldn't physically see the dials inside the pressure switch. And then if you look on the back side here, uh, you can see the die right there. So even if you're wearing the glasses or whatever, you would not have seen this leak without taking that cover off. 
Uh, I personally don't like using the die. I don't like it in my gauges. I don't like it in the system. It is what it is. So now I'm going to change out this pressure switch. As you can see, I've pumped down the system to 13 PSI. So as long as we stay in a positive pressure above zero, um, I won't have to vacuum the system or anything. So we're going to try to swap this really quickly. Obviously, make sure you're using gloves. Um, my preferred method is to recover the refrigerant, but with the pricing of refrigerant and all that good stuff, um, and it's a new customer, let's just kind of, we gave them option A or B, they want option B. Um, so we just do this really quickly. As long as we stay in a positive pressure, if we go below zero, obviously, you know, we've taken too long. And um, at that point, we would have to vacuum out the low side. But in this case, you can hear it's still hissing. We still got pressure in there. So we're all good. We did it in time. She's all tight. And we'll obviously do a leak test to confirm all that. All right, so we're going to bring some refrigerant up. So I've been doing this lately, weighing it before I go up. Um, so you can see here the bottle's got 34 pounds, 12 ounces. Uh, it just saves me bringing the scale up. So you can see there our pressures. We got 87 on the suction. That's plenty to test uh, this pressure switch to see if I have any leaks there. So let's go ahead and do a quick sniff test and see if we have anything here. So far, so good. And then let's obviously go hit up the switch and we should be good here we'll hit the edges of the cover no leaks we are good and we're going to start charging up the system here um, we're low on charge obviously from the previous companies uh, coming in and then you saw that EEV kind of distributor area freezing up so we're definitely low on charge to begin with so let's start charging up the system and let's go from there. You can see our ambient is 83, so that's important. And you can't see it in this video here, but only one of the fans are running, so that's a hint we're low on charge. And obviously the sight glass being low, that's a huge hint that we're low on charge still. All right, so now we want to make sure our charge is good. Obviously we have a sight glass, but let's just do our calculation. So we have an 83 ambient. <clears throat> So if we add 15 to that, we're looking for 98 condenser saturation. So we're at 90 condenser saturation right now. Um, and you're going to see here the temperature has dropped down to 74. The sun's coming in and out, so it's making it difficult to charge here. But you can see there, we're at 90, 90, 91, and 74, and our sight glass is full, and our second condenser fan is running. All right, so let's go figure out what our pressure should be. So for our suction side, current box temp. And we're going to go less 10 Fahrenheit, somewhere around there. We have an EEV, so we'll be somewhere in that area. Okay, so let, let's call it 35 Fahrenheit, and then we're going to subtract 10 Fahrenheit. And that's going to give us our approximate temperature. Because it's an EEV, it's going to be a little bit lower and a little bit off. But this is just the ballpark it. Okay, so 25 Fahrenheit is kind of what we're looking for. So if we go to 25 Fahrenheit, and it's already marked here actually, so this is from a different video, but that's fine. So that gives us 63 PSI. Now our head pressure, that's what we're more concerned about. And that's where our calculation is going to come into play. And this is the one that's going to help us charge our unit. So we're going to take ambient temp. And we're going to add 15 Fahrenheit because that's our condenser split on this one. So in this case, we're up to 74 Fahrenheit on that last uh, clip there. We're going to add 15 Fahrenheit. And that's going to give us 89 Fahrenheit. So and we, and in this case, we can go look up the pressure, but I'm looking at the saturation tempers. I don't even really look at the pressures anymore, but let's just come here, and that's going to give us 201 PSI. But what I'm really looking at is this 89 Fahrenheit. So if you saw my gauge, we're at 90, so we're in the ballpark. That tells me we're charged, and then on top of that, I'm going to obviously add the winter charge, okay, which is a little bit more difficult when it's hot. When it's cold, it's easy to add the winter charge because you can see the sight glass is going to be flashing or bubbling but this is what i'm using to figure out my pressures but more important i'm looking at the saturation temperatures i'm not really looking focusing on the pressures all right so i'm just finishing up on the roof here um, i'm going to go into pump down so obviously i do not want to go back on the roof so let's test our pump down and what i notice once we get around four psi this thing does not want to pull down so i'm going to set the uh for it to cut out around five psi uh, we'll let the customer know the compressor is getting slightly weak 
So I'm gonna cut it off just so it's not struggling and running for three, four, five, six minutes trying to pump down. So we can see there it shut off. Our pump down point is good. Uh, we can get down off the roof now and go finish up downstairs. All right, last thing to do is check the superheat. So we have a 38 box and a 21 saturation temperature on the suction side. So that tells me approximately 17 superheat, but it, that is approximate, okay? So we're gonna go through the settings here and our superheat is 12, which isn't terrible. Our box is full and it's our first cool down. Our suction temperature is 34, okay? So we take our 34 and we subtract it from our 21 there, which gives us 12 or 13, so that's pretty good. So the next thing we want is our saturation temperature is 22. So that is the temperature of the copper. It went to 23 there. So if you go 23 and then we subtract um, what our saturation temperature was, which was 34, you know, that gives us our 12. And you're going to see the superheat's going to come down slowly. Now we're at 10 superheat. So let's go run that calculation one more time. So we're at 9 now, even better. So this EV is working really good. So you can see there my saturation temperature is around 21.9. Let's call it 22. Let's see what the board's telling us. So the board's got it at, if I can scroll through and find this again. So we got 32 suction temperature. So that's the temperature of the copper, the outside of the copper. And our saturation temp is 23. So all right, so let's just go over really quickly there. I was kind of talking really fast there. Our superheat, let's just slow things down. This is obviously very important for efficiency. Um, if our superheat is off, the unit's just gonna take forever to cool down. But more importantly, we do not want liquid going back to that compressor. So our superheat is critical. We're looking for probably eight, nine is what I like on a walk-in cooler and then a freezer is probably six, seven, eight, somewhere in there. So all we're doing is we're taking, it showed SCT. Okay, so that's our suction line temperature. Okay, so they have a probe mounted to the suction line. It is just taking the temperature of the copper. Okay, and we're going to subtract that from our SST. So that's our saturation temperature. And what's our saturation temperature? It's the temperature of the refrigerant. So just say we have, for example, if our vapor pressure is 124 PSI, our saturation temperature would be 60 Fahrenheit. So in our case, our suction line temperature was 32 Fahrenheit. And then our saturation temp on my gauge was showing 21.9. Let's call it 22. But through the transducer on the unit, they were getting 23 Fahrenheit. And that gives us a 9 Fahrenheit superheat. So it's nice that the board can calculate this for us. And like I said, this is super important for efficiency and super important that we do not get uh, liquid flooding back to that compressor. As we know, a compressor does not like liquid and we can easily blow a compressor like this. And I've seen this happen where um, a TXV or an, I haven't seen it on an EV, but a TXV uh, adjusted incorrectly can have this happen. Now I've had an EV go bad on this type of uh, walk-in. So it's really important to understand the saturation temperatures and understand, hey, is the transducer sending back the correct saturation temperature is my probe taking the correct suction line temperature so i like to just put my gauges on there compare and make sure everything is good there